Hello, my name is Roger Henderson, and I'm a GP in Southwest Scotland, and I also co-host the GP Notebook study groups. Welcome to this GP Notebook podcast, where we discuss bite-sized topics aimed at all those of us working in primary care. You can find us on all major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. So do please follow us to receive notifications about new episodes. And if you like what you hear, and many of you tell us that you do, please consider leaving a review to help other listeners find us. You can also follow us on Twitter at GP Notebook for more information about new podcast episodes and study groups, and you can find me on there too, at Roger the Doctor. Finally, you can visit gpnotebook.com for podcast episode show notes and to find out more about upcoming study group meetings. Now, in this episode, I'm going to be discussing diverticular disease, a really common problem that we see in practice, but I thought it might be quite nice to look at a general overview and remind us about the key points we should be thinking about when discussing diverticular disease with our patients or even considering the diagnosis. And I tend to define it as any clinical state caused by symptoms linked to diverticular in the large bowel. And as we know, these are a herniation of mucosa through thickened colonic muscle and are really very common. Now, they may be solitary and found incidentally, or there may be hundreds present. But typically, however many there are, they're usually very small. Typically, 5 to 8 millimetres in diameter, for example, though occasionally you may get to 2 centimetres or bigger in size. Now, there's a really wide range of possible effects from these, and they range from no symptoms whatsoever to severe complicated disease requiring urgent treatment. Now, diverticulosis refers to the presence of diverticula that are asymptomatic, and many of our patients have these. Diverticular disease is when diverticula cause symptoms and is sometimes also known as painful diverticular disease, typically characterized by episodic left lower abdominal colicky pain with or without other non-specific symptoms such as bloating, constipation or diarrhea. And these are symptoms that may also all become recurrent. Diverticulitis, on the other hand, indicates inflammation of a diverticulum or diverticula and may be caused by infection. And other complications of diverticular disease include bleeding, infection, perforation, abscess, peritonitis, fistula formation and bowel obstruction. Now we now think that diverticular disease has many causes, but particularly a low dietary fibre intake. And in the West, this is thought to be the main contributing factor to it developing, along with increasing age. Other causes that we now know are involved include lack of exercise, obesity, especially in younger people, the increased consumption of red meat, somewhat surprisingly tobacco smoking, excess alcohol and caffeine intake, steroids, and in some people, ingestion of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, as we all know, it is really common. In people aged 85 and over, around 80% of people have diverticular disease, and over the age of 45, around 1 in 10. It is, though, quite rare in people below the age of 40. Now, I mentioned that it may have no symptoms at all, and around 75% of people who do have diverticular have no symptoms at all. And of the rest who develop symptoms, about three quarters of these will develop diverticulitis. And the severity of acute diverticulitis I think is best graded using the Hinchy classification. And I think it's just worth reminding ourselves what this is. And there's four stages. So stage one is a small or confined pericolic or mesenteric abscess. Stage two is a large paracolic abscess, often extending into the pelvis. Stage three is a perforated diverticulitis, where a peridiverticular abscess has actually perforated, and that then causes purulent peritonitis. And stage four 
is a perforated diverticulitis, where there is free perforation with fecal peritonitis. Now, the symptoms of diverticular disease essentially reflect the stage and level of the diverticular disease that's present. So looking at uncomplicated diverticular disease, for example, and these are often found coincidentally during screening or other procedures such as routine colon cancer colonoscopy, if there are no symptoms, no action needs to be taken at all. And symptoms of simple diverticular disease, if they are present, are often very nonspecific, including bloating, constipation, and low abdominal pain, often left-sided, that might be worsened by eating and eased on passing stool or wind. Diverticulitis, on the other hand, should be suspected in patients with constant severe abdominal pain in the left lower quadrant, plus any of these typical symptoms, fever and tachycardia, which are relatively common, or a sudden change in bowel habit with significant rectal bleeding or the passage of mucus from the rectum, or tenderness in the left lower quadrant and occasionally a palpable mass. And bowel sounds may be reduced, but obviously remember that these may be increased in obstruction. Now, shock or hypotension are actually unusual symptoms in acute diverticulitis. And the message from the wayside pulpit that we often forget is that Asian patients often predominantly have right-sided diverticular and so typically present with right lower quadrant pain. So if you have a patient of Asian origins with right-sided lower quadrant pain, don't automatically assume appendicitis think diverticulitis as well. And in all cases, anorexia, nausea and vomiting may also occur. Now, 5% or so of patients with diverticulitis will then develop further complications such as obstruction, abscess, fistula, perforation or bowel stricture. We sometimes forget that severe bleeding can also occur in about 5% of patients with diverticulosis and is actually a relatively common cause of lower GI bleeding. And this usually arises in the proximal colon. And the typical presentation here is of unexpected, abrupt, painless bleeding with mild low abdominal discomfort and the passage of large amounts of bloods or clots, PR. Now, fortunately, this bleeding usually settles spontaneously in around 80% of patients, with a re-bleeding rate of around one in three people who've got diverticular bleeding. Now, you don't need me to tell you that there are many possible other diagnoses that need to be considered if you're looking at a patient with a possible diagnosis of diverticular disease. And I'm not going to list all these because there are so many, but the typical ones to think about are irritable bowel syndrome, as this may closely mimic symptomatic diverticular disease, acute appendicitis, inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal disease, and pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, investigating diverticular disease, again, depends on the stage that we're at. So, in cases of asymptomatic diverticulosis, no investigations are required at all. In simple diverticular disease, I would suggest we always take a full blood count, because this should be normal, but in diverticulitis, the white cell count may be raised, and colonoscopy may then be required to confirm the diagnosis and rule out other pathologies, such as colorectal cancers. In suspected diverticulitis, then inflammatory markers, and I'm thinking especially CRP here, full blood count, use and ease, should be assessed, and if there's any evidence of inflammation, then ideally a contrast CT scan and hospital admission should be arranged. But if you don't find any increase in inflammatory marker levels, it's worth reconsidering the diagnosis. Asymptomatic diverticulosis requires no treatment, just as it requires no investigations. But if you've got a patient with constipation, for example, then they may benefit from using bulk forming laxatives as well as increasing their intake of fluids, dietary fibre and fresh fruit, fruit and vegetables. Now, there is a myth out there 
that people with diverticulosis need to avoid things like seeds or nuts, and that's very prevalent online. There is actually no need for people with diverticulosis to avoid fruit skin, popcorn, nuts, or seeds. And we should tell our patients that. And we should also advise them about the benefits of things like exercise, weight loss, and smoking cessation. So that's asymptomatic diverticular disease management. If we then go on to symptomatic diverticular disease, by which I mean the presence of diverticular with symptoms such as mild abdominal pain or tenderness, but no systemic symptoms, then again, dietary advice and lifestyle advice should be given as we would for asymptomatic diverticular disease patients. However, another important message here is that we should not give antibiotics to people with symptomatic diverticular disease. Consider using analgesics, absolutely fine, such as paracetamol, but avoid non-steroidals and opiates if at all possible, as they are associated with an increased risk of diverticular perforation. So I always try and just stick with the normal dosages of paracetamol if at all. And antispasmodics can also be really helpful sometimes in treating abdominal cramps. Now, obviously, in the rare cases there's any significant rectal bleeding, hospital admission should obviously be arranged. So again, let's turn to acute diverticulitis. So uncomplicated diverticu acute diverticulitis, if you've got a patient and you're certain that's a diagnosis, but they are otherwise systemically well, again, avoid using antibiotics if at all possible. Simply treat them with simple analgesia and advise them to return if their symptoms change or worsen. However, if a patient with uncomplicated acute diverticulitis is unwell, if they're immunosuppressed, or if they've got other significant comorbidities, then it is entirely appropriate to offer them oral antibiotics. Now, the NICE recommendation for suspected or confirmed uncomplicated acute diverticulitis is a five-day course of oral antibiotics with amoxicillin and clavulinate as the first-line choice. Now, if they're unsuitable or the patient has a penicillin allergy, then use cephalexin plus metronidazole or trimethoprim plus metronidazole. Ciprofloxacin can be used, but only if switching from intravenous cipro with specialist advice plus metronidazole. So amoxicillin, clavulinate as the first line choice, but if that's not possible, then cephalexin plus metronidazole or trimethoprim plus metronidazole for five days. In the first two to three days of that course, clear liquids ideally should be taken alone and then solid food slowly reintroduced as the patient's symptoms improve. Now, if you've got a patient with diverticulitis who has abdominal pain, fever or leukocytosis and they're taking oral antibiotics, they can be treated safely at home provided no complications are present. But if the fever and leukocytosis persist after 72 hours or the patient's symptoms worsen, then they should be admitted to hospital for the consideration of intravenous antibiotics until they clinically improve. However, fortunately for us, most patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis recover following medical treatment, and they don't need to go on to have surgical intervention. Let's then move on to complicated acute diverticulitis. And this is what we don't want to see. And these, requiring further investigation and possible surgical intervention, are the ones I mentioned before, such as bleeding, abscess, obstruction, perforation, and fistula. And they do warrant surgical appraisal because surgery may be needed for diverticular disease that doesn't respond to medical management. And it's a slightly salutary fact that 15 to 30% of patients admitted to hospital with acute diverticulitis will end up needing surgery. And obviously we all know that free perforation with generalized peritonitis is a surgical emergency and carries a significant mortality rate of around 30%. Now following surgical treatment, 
unfortunately around one quarter of all patients continue to remain symptomatic. So thinking about the referrals, prognosis and prevention here, if you've got a patient with suspected complicated acute diverticulitis, admit them for the same day assessment and anyone with features suggestive of possible colitis should always be referred. Obviously, if you're suspecting cancer, then urgent referral via the local cancer pathway should be done on the same day of consultation with that patient. Now, fortunately, the majority of patients with diverticulosis remain asymptomatic long-term, but diverticular disease does recur in about a third of patients following medical treatment, usually within four to five years. So what should we be telling our patients? Well, to help reduce the risk of diverticular disease developing or recurring, an increased dietary fibre intake is always required, and improving the consumption of fruit and vegetables is the easy way of doing this, as is limiting red meat intake, reducing salt consumption, and increasing physical activity, not only to maintain an ideal body weight, but also to help avoid obesity longer term. And a final point here, which I do think is worth mentioning, is that things like mesalazine, antibiotics, or even probiotics shouldn't be used to prevent recurrent diverticulitis, as the data is that they have no long-term impact. So I do hope you found that podcast overview on diverticular disease helpful, and thank you so much for listening. But do have a look at the show notes that accompany this episode at gpnotebook.com, and we'd be very grateful if you consider following the podcast and leaving us a review on your favourite podcast platform. It really does help. Feel free to get in touch via social media at GP Notebook or email us support at gpnotebook.com if you have any questions, comments or ideas for future podcasts. We really do like to hear your suggestions. You should also visit us at gpnotebook.com to register for our virtual GP Notebook study groups and download free shortcuts to help improve the lives of our patients in primary care. But as always, until the next time, thank you for listening and goodbye.